Hi, I'm Corey, and I... Wait, this is different. Oh well. Still have too many tapes. So, yeah, welcome to the desk. This is where I edit too many tapes. I decided to put away the green screen and the glitch effects and the panache this time because this episode is different. Whenever I start a tape review, I say basically the same thing. I'm Corey, that's me, and I have too many tapes. I show the tape, the little Law & Order Sting plays, and we get down to business. But it's not just a catchphrase, I genuinely have too many tapes. I have hundreds, and most of them are not very good. You see, I scour thrift stores pretty much every weekend, and when I overfish my local supply, I turn to eBay. Thank you to my patrons, by the way, as this little habit is starting to get wildly expensive. Two to five dollars for a thrift store tape just hurts, you know? Stings the soul. I try to find the weirdest and most interesting looking tapes out there that fit into my increasingly specific niche. If I'm lucky, there's a rip of it already on YouTube so I can preview it before I buy. If not, well, I'm judging a book by its cover. Or a tape by its box art. But Corey, you say, you do like an episode a month. The math ain't mathing. And you'd be right. I take in way, way more than I can cover, or more correctly, will ever cover. I have hundreds of tapes, yes, and I try my best to at least sample all of them, but only the truly best slash worst slash weirdest make it as full episodes of Too Many Tapes. Because, as hard as it is to believe, I have a criteria for what makes it onto the show. It has to have an aesthetic interest, something off-putting or unique. I tend to stick towards live action. Bad animation is easy to point out and boring to critique. Preferably the tape should have puppets or mascot costumes. Those are handmade, designed, manufactured. And they're the real hallmark of a kid's TV show in a post-Muppet Sesame Street world. Something good, something bad, something hilariously horrifying. It needs a visual hook I can sink my teeth into. A quick disclaimer, don't bite hooks. Ouch. It also needs some narrative value. It has to, you know, not bore me. It has to keep me engaged, or at least have enough bizarre charm that it's worth dissecting. Give me characters I can hold on to. Give me a story I haven't seen before. And finally, it has to have something relevant that's worth discussing. I was raised by media like this, and I love reflecting on how my dumb brain was shaped by it, so I'm often trying to find the clearest examples of tapes where the lesson they're trying to impart is something noble but misguided, or actively malicious. But that's a tough needle to thread. How far do I want to platform some of the more harmful corners of religious and educational media? The real problem here is that I can watch, or at the very least scan through, a dozen or so tapes looking for a winner. A shining, brilliant, awful diamond. And sometimes, at the end of a day in the tape mines, I wind up empty-handed. Which is why I started doing video essays about movies sometimes. But other times, something almost makes it to the show? It hooks me in some way, and I end up getting close to committing, and then I don't, for some reason or other. These tapes get relegated to some weird limbo zone, not quite interesting enough to talk about for 20 minutes, but too strange or fascinating to discard entirely. And let me tell you, that pile is starting to stack up. So, in lieu of a truly cursed object of power this month, I've decided to give you a sampler platter of cursed tapes. Heavy hors d'oeuvres, if you will, and I'll talk about why I found them interesting and why they didn't cut the mustard. That phrase has never made sense to me. Who's cutting mustard? It's a, it's a liquid. Speaking of mustard, though, do you want to see a monstrous yellow dinosaur that wants to make sure kids don't get molested? Yellow Dino You Can't Fool Me is a cut-down version of a much longer and much darker video called Tricky People, wherein the titular Yellow Dino creates a rock and roll band of teens and kids who advocate for situational awareness and not getting kidnapped, or worse. The video initially appealed to me because it has a lot of the same stranger danger elements that fuel the 80s and 90s panic, but its focus is way, way more specific. However, the video seems uncomfortable talking about molestation in any useful or helpful way, so the whole thing ends up feeling like an exercise in metaphor and euphemism to the point of meaninglessness. This creates issues with the tone, to say the least. It's both too heavy and not serious enough, and it treats its subject matter with a curiously cavalier attitude that I can't quite put my finger on. The star of the show here, though, is Yellow Dino, and he's... wow, just... wow, and awful monstrosity. He sounds like Slurms McKenzie, and he looks like Joe Camel when he's wearing the jacket and sunglasses, and when he takes them off, I descend into an indescribable pit of madness from which there is no escape. What 
happened to his eyes? Who took his eyes? Now everybody in the house, let me hear you say, oh, yeah! At the end of the day, I had to let this one pass me by. Maybe I'll cover tricky people one day, but it's been cut to such shreds here that it's almost impossible to talk about in any linear way. And honestly, I don't know how much gently sardonic humor I can wring out of something so horrible. I don't have the finesse to thread that needle. I'm a tank, not a scalpel. This one, though. This one got close. Do you remember the stranglehold Sherry Lewis had on public television with Lamb Chop? This was the Christian precursor. Ventriloquism is a very complicated and storied craft for which I have not a lot of love. Can't think of any ventriloquists I'm into. The last guy to hit it big with ventriloquism mostly did it on the back of exhaustingly boring racial stereotypes, but Jeff Dunham's puppets at least looked kind of good. Little Marcy, on the other hand, looks like this. I know, I'm sorry. She's in there now, up in your head, waiting for a quiet moment to pounce. Marcy Tigner was a Christian ventriloquist who made it big in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and cashed the last of her niche fame in on a small handful of TV specials in the late 80s. This fever dream of a tape seemingly has it all. I'm a sucker for Christian puppets. I'm a sucker for ill-advised vanity projects. I'm a sucker for ruining my mental well-being with cursed knowledge. And Little Marcy is truly, truly cursed. Annabelle from the conjuring levels of cursed. Jesus loves me, this I know. Puppeteering is so rudimentary from Tigner, and all the other non-Marcy puppets look like they exist in a totally different universe. Their mouths barely move, their hair is weirdly realistic, and there's almost no expression in the way they're performed. It's like they're not puppets so much as children sewn into puppet outfits who can't quite get out. And yet, nothing hits here. It's empty. Like, Tigner didn't ever figure out what to do with the Little Marcy character other than sing some baby-voiced hymns about God's love. It's both too wholesome and too impotent to laugh at. All style and no substance. If you thought I was grasping at straws to find things to talk about in Chicken Minute, you would have lost your will to live after 20 minutes of me vamping about Little Marcy. Marcy Tigner died in 2012 at the age of 90 after seeing her music find unexpected new popularity in the 90s as irony-poisoned Gen Xers praised her for her kitsch. In that way, I'm late to the party. But there's also no joy to be found in preying on something so earnest, even if it's the worst thing I have ever laid my eyes on. Speaking of wholesome, Guidepost Junctions genuinely surprised me. You see, it turns out that the voice of the Little Mermaid, Jody Benson, is an extremely evangelical Christian with a lot of connections, some money to burn, and a passion for education. And she did the thing that seemingly every 80s and 90s evangelical star did. She produced a children's video series with herself as the lead. Again, hubristic vanity project? That's my beat! It had all of the hallmarks of another Mary Lou's flip-flop shop. And what's more, it had a giant turtle mascot who answered big questions kids have about life. It's perfect. It's gotta be horrible, right? Something that would kind of implode on itself beautifully? Well, as it turns out, it's kind of great. Let it never be said that I can't praise a Christian kids TV show on this channel, it's just easier to cover the bad ones than the good, and the good ones are shockingly rare. Jody has Disney connections, and it really shows. Guideposts Junction is fairly well written, the kids are all engaged and good performers, the production design is great, and the songs are pretty decent. The turtle isn't even that nightmarish, she's kinda cute. It's also not all that toxic in terms of the lessons it was trying to impart, credit where credit is due. It's also simply too genuine to make fun of. It's the right level of silly, serious, and earnest, and that makes it bulletproof. You survived this round, Jody, but I'm watching you. 
Next on the pile seemed like an instant winner. It's a low-budget 90s VHS pilot called Jungle Jamboree, and it's about a couple of adults who bring some kids with them into the world of make-believe they found when they were kids themselves. This jelly bean jungle is full of age-appropriate life lessons and puppets of questionable quality. It's everything I look for in a tape. It looks like it was made for approximately $25, it feels like it was written by a primitive 1990s version of ChatGPT, and it's existentially upsetting to look at. The sets? Awful. The lighting? Amateurish. The effects? Bargain basement. The puppets? Remember everyone, pretending is a special thing. It equals any gift you bring. You'll travel places near and far with friends who like you as you are. So share this gift with friends above, and share the special gift of love. The less we say about them, the better, but just look at that lion. Look at it. Really, truly look at it. Sit in its awfulness with me. Uncomfortable, right? It's also one of the most expensive VHS tapes I've ever bought for this show. I think it ran me about 30 bucks. I know, tape prices are going wild right now, thanks for nothing, speculators, but shelling out this much for an amateurish 90s puppet show did hurt. I spent patron money on this, so I have to show it, you know? But here's the thing, the tape is like a hundred minutes long. I imagine this was a three episode pilot for what eventually became the slightly higher budgeted Jelly Bean Jungle show from the 90s, so I guess you're getting value for money, but it's also in Terminable. Each minute that passed after the initial shock of the aesthetic wore off made me feel like I was dying at 4x speed. I will suffer through a lot to make this show, but the one thing I will not do is bore myself. Because if a show looks as ridiculous and horrible as this and it can't somehow spark my interest, something has gone horribly, horribly wrong, and there's no coming back from that. Nothing here is redeemable, interesting, or engaging in any way. It's inanity of such a high magnitude that it's almost impressive. It's so low energy that it may be negative energy. They should give this tape to insomnia sufferers as a foolproof sleeve method. It could be used as a weapon of mass destruction to take power grids offline. So, alas, it gets chucked into the bin, a reminder that you shouldn't judge a tape by its cover, its rarity, or its price point. The last tape on the bin here, though, is one I've been trying to make an episode on for almost five years. Every time I lose my step or get behind or don't know what episode to make next, I briefly, inevitably, turn to Quigley's Village. Alongside the filling station, it was one of the first VHS tapes to get me into collecting and chronicling all of the terrible, misguided ways we tried to guide children in the 80s and 90s. And Quigley's Village is a particularly awful slice of 90s low-rent kids' media. Its lessons are noxious and regressive, its puppets are audio-visual coarse-grit sandpaper, and the lead youth pastor has the vibe of a guy that shows up with wine coolers to a house only to be confronted by Chris Hansen. What a beautiful morning. I'm glad you came to visit us today at the village. Okay, Bubba, your turn. Okay. I like you. I, I like, like you. You like me. You, you like, like me. me. Do like me. Do like me. On one, two, three. On one, two, three. Everybody wave. <laughs> Everybody laugh. <laughs> The premise, briefly, is that Mr. Quigley, the creepy youth pastor guy with a smile that strikes genuine fear into my heart, is the de facto mayor of a small village of fuzzy animal children who all need to learn lessons about growing up and righteousness and all that jazz. One of the animals who has full sentience is a parrot, or maybe a toucan, that he keeps in a cage outside of his home. Don't know why the bird has to live in a cage while everybody else has their own houses, but that's a question for another time. It also has some of these screechiest songs I've ever seen. I thank you, Lord, for food to help me grow. And as I go, I want your love to show. I swear, I have tried to make an episode out of this show once a year for the last five years. It's everything I've ever looked for in a show to cover on too many tapes, and I own about a dozen episodes. So what's stopping me, you ask? Why don't I cover this relatively well-known and beloved slash derided disaster? Well, I tried. 
I genuinely did. It was going to be last year's Christmas episode. I wrote the script and I uploaded the tape to my second channel to try and get some eyeballs on it. And within seconds of uploading it, the entire video got blocked. Not just demonetized, totally blocked. You see, the creators of Quigley's Village are the antithesis of the creators of Salty or Gerbert. The rights holders of Vision Media still see so much value in their intellectual property that they've created their own YouTube Kids sub-channel to continue making money on this show that hasn't had a new episode since 1990. They sponge up the ad revenue, while they also continue to sell the episodes on DVD. They think it's timeless. They think this. Thanks for the promises you keep, and thanks for Jesus Christ, your son. Thank you for Fred family. Still has relevance in 2023. And maybe they're right, who knows. So, I'm afraid, one of the best, wildest, and most fascinating potential episodes of Too Many Tapes is prevented by the omnipresent threat of channel annihilation. That's the way the Quigley crumbles. I hope that this was a fun, or at the very least somewhat insightful, look at my process. The search for tapes is never over, by the way. If there's a show I haven't covered on Too Many Tapes that exists out there on VHS, please let me know in the comments. I'm always looking to add more tapes to the collection. Maybe it'll make the show, and maybe it winds up on the pile. Either way, the quest continues to find the wildest, silliest, most uncomfortable television shows ever made. I can't be stopped. Thank you all for watching Too Many Tapes. Please like this video, subscribe to my channel, and hit the bell icon to get updates for when I upload videos. If you want to help out a small YouTube channel, consider donating a dollar or more a month to my Patreon. Tapes are getting more and more expensive, and for $2 or more a month you get early access to my videos, as well as my genuine eternal gratitude for helping me keep this channel going. If you donate 50 or more dollars a month, like Cammy, you're my primary tape financer, and you get a movie recommendation. I frequently trawl used Blu-ray shops, and this month I came across a movie I hadn't thought about in a while, 2013's The Spectacular Now. It's a really well-made coming-of-age movie with a script from the writers of 500 Days of Summer and breakout performances from Shailene Woodley and Miles Teller right before they both got wildly famous. It's maybe a bit ham-handed at times, but it mostly works really well. It's on Max right now, check it out. If you donate 20 or more dollars a month, you're Nato Kitsch, your name is in the credits all huge, and you can't fool me. You just... you just can't can't do it. For $10 or more a month, you help me assuage the pain of a lost Quigley's Village episode, and your names get to be pretty big in the credits, too. And for $5 a month, you are perpetually at the top of my tape pile, and you get early access to my videos. Thank you all again for watching, and I'll see you next time on Too Many Tapes. Why can't I hold all these tapes? Go! <laughs> why can't I hold, why can't I hold all these tapes?